Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Hal Coppersmith. We're sitting here at Hilly's Bar on the Bowery, talking with Mr. Saul Urich, the author of Warrior, The Bag, and Fertig, and who recently wrote for Monthly Review, a socialist publication, an article called The Political Economy of Junk. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Saul Urick, who will discuss junk with you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> what, I, what I'd like to do is uh, tell a little bit about the history of this uh, article, The Political Economy of Junk. Uh, originally, I grew out of, I was commissioned by the, I was asked by the Times magazine section to do an article on, uh, well, the only way I can put it is like the romantic, heroic death of the kid junkie. And, you know, the Times was into doing a lot of this kind of thing, uh, focusing on the individual uh, tragic case rather than focusing on, on heroin and drugs in general as a kind of a system. Um, I mean, being a little tired of it, instead what I decided to do is to make a kind of a, an economic and social analysis of uh, the whole drug traffic. Uh, <clears throat> when I finally sent in the finished report, it... They, they first said they didn't understand it, then they weren't interested in it. Most of my material, oddly enough, came out of the Times itself, if you read from day to day, uh, and <clears throat> I think if you know what to look for. And part of, another part of the way the article grew originally was um, I was working in Park Slope with uh, some street kids, white working class kids, uh, Puerto Rican kids, and most of them were on drugs of all sorts, but nobody was on heroin at that point. Uh, when Opera Nixon's uh, Operation Intercept kicked in, their first immediate spontaneous reaction to all of that was, uh, Nixon is trying to hook us. And several interesting things started to happen. Uh, first of all, uh, marijuana, which was presumably being stopped at the border uh, between Mexico and the United States, between Canada and the United States, stopped altogether. There was no, ma no marijuana to be gotten anywhere. Uh, and kids, in fact, started to turn on to, uh, to heroin. In fact, this began to sweep the whole country, and you began to find it in little towns, kinds of towns that had never been afflicted with any kind of drug problem before. You found the stuff, as a matter of fact, in uh, elite colleges. You found students involved with heroin where they'd never been involved before. You found it in, in high-class prep schools, you know. And <clears throat> as I began to research things, I began to find out some interesting things. First of all, marijuana, a significant amount of marijuana, the amounts that are required to really, uh, you know, spread it around the country with, to the degree that I know that it's used, can't come in by individual bearers carrying a kilo or two into some small business through the border. And, in fact, both... The Times and the Christian Science Monitor pointed out that the operation involving marijuana really involved huge oil trucks with false centers. It involved barges being floated up uh, along the uh, California coast. I mean, in other words, that was a big operation. It didn't come in through the points where the, the, the checkpoints where they were watching for this stuff. So, and at the same time, when Operation Intercept, Intercept kicked in, uh, you began to see, certainly in my neighborhood and from everybody I've talked to from all over the country, you began to see people selling heroin on the streets. The price went down immediately. Uh, bags of heroin were given away free, as a matter of fact. $5 bag cost $3. Um, and people began to get stoned. Now, obviously, what seemed to happen is not that Operation Intercept stopped anything, but people stopped selling it in bulk and at the same time the heroin started to flow. Uh, this to me seemed distinctly like collusion. Uh, all right, it's very difficult to find out who does what, and I suppose if I knew that kind of thing, I wouldn't be alive today. Uh, but I don't, you know, sooner or later that information is going to come out. I mean, in other words, somebody asked me, uh, am I proposing that the United States government uses junk as a kind of political tool? Uh, I'm implying that it, that it does. I mean, my feeling is that it does. I've just talked to somebody, for instance, who has been down in a, variety, in a number of uh, uh, army places, and what he said is the soldiers are saying that the military is glad that they have junk. Uh, 
They're glad that they have junk because that's one way of cooling soldiers' descent. I mean, and there are a lot of misconceptions about junk, that you can't do things while you're, you're stoned. It depends on your dosage, it depends on your personality, and it depends, most of all, on the availability of the stuff. Okay, as I began to look into the thing, I began to find out some interesting things. First of all, the myth is that most of the stuff had come, had been grown in Turkey. In fact, the United Nations Health Organization points out that 83% of the world's, world's opium is grown in Indochina. Okay. The collection point is on the Plain of Jars, where there are a variety of CIA camps, among other things. Um, around, and, 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 in other words, the whole northern tier of Indochina is the Mio tribesmen are devoted, they're devoted to growing junk. Who collects the stuff from them? Well, there are remnants of the Chinese Nationalist Army, the Kuomintang, that got in there after the Second World War and have never left. In fact, there is an article in a magazine called True, uh, which came out, I think, in the early 50s, where an author named Tom, Ch Tom Chamales, who is now dead, po pointed out that while he was in that theater, a battalion of American soldiers who, who tried to interfere with this trade were wiped out by Chinese nationalist soldiers, and nothing was ever done about that. Okay, the next, the next step of that, uh, a lot of the stuff is flown or trucked out from the, you know, from, play, from this collection point around the Plain of Jars in Laos into Saigon. Now, Senator Gruning has accused the CIA and Marshal Key and two of being involved in this trade. Now, the interesting thing is I was told recently that our incursion in Laos seems to be coincident, oddly enough, with the harvest season for opium. Uh, I mean, I'm not, this is not to say that that is the only reason that we're in Vietnam. There are a lot of other reasons. I mean, uh, one of the reasons, of course, is that there is chrome in Southeast Asia. We don't have any chrome. Uh, there is manganese in Southeast Asia. We don't have any manganese. And now, all of a sudden, they're announcing we've discovered this huge shelf of oil. Uh, but they've known about that shelf of oil for years. People, people have prospected that out, and it's to be found, the information on that is to be found years ago in a little document that's available to the oil industry or available to you if you've got like three, four hundred dollars a year for this, this newsletter called Platt's Oilgram. They've known about this oil all this time. And I mean, this is not new. Okay. <clears throat> now, what's the next step? I mean, uh, the, the popu the popular way of talking about this is that this stuff is, refined in places like um, Marseille. Marseille is supposed to be a big center. That center, to, incidentally, seems to have shifted from Marseille to Greece since the military junta took over. Right. And the military junta took over, I am sure, with the good aid of the CIA, because among other things, one, several very important American businesses are in uh, Greece, including, um, oh, what's his name? I'll think of the name afterwards. I mentioned they've been given a whole whole island, all of Crete, to redevelop. Um, at any rate, but we forget one thing. See, like uh, presumably Corsican mafia people. I mean, mafia is not the word for them, but the Corsicans are the ones that refine the stuff in uh, Marseille. Uh, now, obviously, no illegal operation can operate anywhere without the collusion of the police. The police know everything. Um, now, we forget, of course, who was in Indochina before we were, the French. In fact, there are still Corsicans in the Saigon Police Department. Okay. Um, now, the question is, who, who really uh, distributes the stuff, brings it in, has, in, sense, in a sense, the means of uh, you know, uh, distribution and communication between Europe and the United States, between Asia and the United States? I think, ultimately, the final, dis the final distributor before it hits the United States is the mafia itself. Uh, there are people say, well, the mafia hasn't been into this kind of thing because it was bad for their image. What that means is that they're not, for the most part, selling the stuff on the streets. That is, there are mafia people, lower echelon mafia people, who may be selling the stuff in the streets. Um, but the point is they're doing this on their own. The distribution, the clean kind of work is really not, is, is being, the clean kind of work is being handled by, I think, the mafia. Now, in the late 50s and early 60s, what took place in New York City, for instance, was a, a political struggle uh, between various ethnic groups for, in effect, 
you want to look at it in a, an ironic way, community control of heroin. Uh, the blacks got community control of heroin so that they were enabled to, you know, ch feed their, their district. The uh, Puerto Ricans have taken care of their district. However, the Puerto Rican pushers are at this point being killed off by Cuban pushers. After all, we had to find something that we had to do with all the Cuban refugees we had here who were into mafia things in Cuba and got kicked out when Castro took over. One of the big points of entry used to be Cuba itself. The stuff would come in in, in uh, sugar boats, it would come in in oil boats, things like that. Uh, now, when you read about people being picked up and vast quantities of the stuff being picked up, that's like nothing. I mean, you've got to understand that the fantastic uh, spread of the stuff. Now, I estimated conservatively, and I think conservatively, that there are about like 500,000 junkies in the United States. I think it's much more, but I'll say 500,000 because at, a, at an average rate of, let's say, a $20 a day habit, which is not excessive, because there are people who have $150 a day habits, that means that there, that just for the sale of junk alone, that's a three, three and a half billion dollar industry just in the junk. Now, when you start to consider all the kinds of things, the spin-off industries, if you want to look at that, that flow out of this thing, you start to see that one of the greatest spin-off industries is the stealing industry. Um, now, for the purposes, maybe of irony, you know, one of the ways I try to look at the junkie is not this, you know, this kind of depraved creature seeking, you know, like nothing but this constant pleasure, but in fact, the junkie, the street junkie, as distinguished from the uh, junkie who has the money to pay for it and really is not uptight about it, <coughs> is that <coughs> the junkie is the hardest working kind of person you want, you can imagine. I mean, he is stealing from morning to night to, to satisfy his habit. Now, uh, talking to a number of kids who were into this kind of thing, uh, I would ask about the kinds of returns they would get on the stuff they would steal. Uh, it ran something like 20 to 1, 10 to 1, sometimes 5 to 1. In other words, if you, if you brought in maybe a $300 television, you might get $20, $25 for it. Well, I took just, again, a, a very conservative estimate, uh, and I figured that at the rate of 10 to 1, in other words, you were getting like one-tenth of the value of what you stole, it would still come to something like a $30 billion industry, a $30 billion industry devoted to stealing. Uh, I've talked to, you know, the, the amounts that are stolen from um, uh, department stores in New York City, for instance, runs into the millions. Now, I'm sure that my figures, as I say, are very, are very conservative. They're, they're nowhere, they don't anywhere near approach the whole, you know, the, the real figures. But on top of that, there are a tremendous num number of programs that are being mounted for the, uh, the, the care, the feeding, the therapy, what have you, of junkies. I mean, I think they're all Mickey Mouse programs. I mean, uh, I have heard, for instance, that a number of these things have really been set up. The statistics have been rigged uh, about the, the kinds of success they've had. No, the basic thing, what it boils down to is how can you have success unless you get with, with people who are junkies or other kinds of addicts, unless you give some kind of, you know, there's, there's some kind of stake in society that they have. If people have absolutely nothing to do and their whole lives are miserable, I mean, what, what else can you expect? I mean, they, they would just rather cut out of society. Um, I mean, I, I think, of course, the basic cause for getting, well, there are several causes, but I think one of the basic causes for getting involved with heroin is, is the fact that there is nothing to do. There is no way to fit into society. There's no purpose. School is absolutely horrible. Uh, people, kids know right away that whatever they do, they are not going anywhere, except for some rare exception, which we then hold up and say, you see, you can make it from the bottom up. Um, and what starts to happen, in effect, is I think, ultimately, we are heading towards a society where control, social control, is really going to be exercised by drugs, because that's a basically easy way to do things. Now, people hear all kinds of stories about junk. But people can function on junk. Junkies can function if their dosage is regulated. You can function on methadone. Um, with methadone, you can control the market because you're not dependent on all the kinds of international ramifications because you can produce the stuff chemically. There are, as a matter of fact, a variety of different kinds of drug programs that are going on, that is, drug programs in a different sense, uh, all over the country. For instance, the administration of drugs to calm down disruptive school children. There may be as many as three million kids in this country who are on some kind of drugs. Kids going down to the kindergarten level.
what's more, I, I suspect, I mean, this, this has been written about by a number of uh, high-level sociologists, political uh, scientists, as ultimately the answer that we're going to have to, you know, like we're going to have to implement this thing because, after all, industrial society is too tense and people are having a great difficulties adjusting to it and how do you, how do you cool all the kinds of uh, things that have gone on. Um, people like, uh, gee, I can never pronounce this name, like uh, this big, this big new Brzezinski, you know, who teaches at Columbia. Other people have suggested that this is the way out. So I think what, you, what ultimately is in the cards is a kind of drugged out society where, and certainly if you're drugged, you're not really into making revolution. You know. Um, now, as I said, uh, I think I think if one looks at the whole thing as a profit-making venture, because it is a profit-making venture, I mean, the, the money involved in it is fantastic, and if you also look at American history, you begin to see that the basic ethos of this country has been to make money at any price. I mean, we've talked about the comforts we've provided and so forth and so on, but the basic thing about this is if any industry is geared to to profit its technology is going to be fifth rate everything about it what it produces is going to be fifth rate because it's going to be geared to, to uh, turn over a tremendous amount of stuff in as quick a way as possible now the thing about this society is I mean the question I began to ask like a lot of the kids I'd worked with knew knew the horrors of being a junkie the question was why why did they go into this kind of thing I mean which raises the whole question that a lot of radicals and uh, if you'll forgive the expression hippies have raised about the benign drugs the good drugs is against the bad drugs um, the point about that I think is that if you are in the, in the position of being stoned a good part of the time I mean what you want is to be stoned it doesn't matter what you're going to take ultimately that's what you're going to need because real life is just going to be too tense it's not it's not that marijuana inevitably leads you to junk but if life is unbearable in some sense and you're always stoned out of your head that's what you're going to turn to um, the other thing is that um, this being a, a society in which consumption is always pushed at a fantastic amount uh, what we have created is a group of a, a vast grouping of people that I can only call consumption junkies. I mean, they've got to turn over a certain product constantly. I mean, the product can be an automobile. You buy the automobile, the automobile falls apart. You go on to the next one, or the next model makes it obsolete. Now, with the proper kind of um, training and orientation, you can do that same kind of thing with sensations. I mean, I think, for instance, one of the reasons for possibly the demise of the, uh, the younger section of the new left has been that they have not been able to sustain any kind of work at all. They have been trained by, by every means disposable at this, of this establishment to move from one scene to the next scene. They're consuming experiences. Okay. Um, now, the, the next thing I talked about in this article was the question of the political use of drugs and the political use, uh, in a sense, for uh, stoning out uh, vast segments of a population that may be potentially disruptive. For instance, uh, it might be useful to go back and recall your history about the Chinese. The, Indi the English were into the, uh, the opium trade, brought in vast amounts of stuff, um, partly and that was for profit, but also partly it had a political usage. The Americans were into that in, in the 19th century. In fact, a number of very reputable American fortunes are founded on the opium trade, uh, including the Peabody's of Boston and the Delano's, who I think is the grandfather of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, that money, of course, was invested in other directions later on. In the 30s, the Japanese laid fantastic amounts of opium on the Chinese. Chiang Kai-shek was into the opium trade and, and prostitution. Uh, so, I mean, you know, there's precedence for this kind of thing. And I'm talking to a number of people, uh, I began to find out some interesting things. Um, for instance, in the Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant riots of 1964, I think one of the great lingering fears was the next summer was going to repeat that experience. And uh, talking to people who lived in those communities, they said they were shocked at the amounts of heroin that appeared when summer really began to get hot in those communities. Uh, not too long afterwards, there was a big rumble in, uh, I think it was East New York, between uh, blacks and um, uh, Italians. This thing was arbitrated 
by one of the uh, by a mafia person uh, name of Joey Gallo I think it was and the other person who arbitrated was a black leader but who also happened to be the chief pusher in that area uh, now I believe that it is certainly somebody's notion of how to cool things to get everybody stoned on heroin it also does not take very much to figure out that certainly like advanced elements of the student movement who are into experimenting with all kinds of things and have certain romantic hang-ups about the, uh, uh, the c kinds of street life led by street people and blacks and Puerto Ricans in particular are going to try a number of their experiences too because that they perceive to be a form of manhood and one of the things I think that a lot of radicals got into oddly enough uh, for a lot of reasons, but including that, was, was heroin. In effect, this is one of the forces, I think, that's helped cool, you know, like further escalation. That, that and so many other things that, you know, I can't go into right now. But, uh, well, why not? I mean, if you threaten with revolution, I think that heroin, in a sense, from the point of view of cooling a society, is much, much better than guns are. Guns raise all kinds of messy questions, I mean, and possibly people start to shoot back. Uh, I think that kind of thing was ultimately maybe in the cards. Um, but when you're, when you're a junkie, when you're hustling for this stuff, when you're involved in a whole scene which has not only all kinds of romantic things attached to it, but you really need your, your next fix, you are absolutely depoliticized. Uh, there is no loyal, there's no such thing as group loyalty as far as a junkie is concerned. Um, I mean, it's every man for himself. I mean, I, and, I, and having, like, worked with some of these kids, they rob each other, they betray each other, they'll do any, anything because the fix becomes the most important thing, especially if they're uptight. Eventually, I think, you know, what happens once you're, you are a junkie, I mean, you know, like, you just can't function politically anymore. Um, and so, I mean, as I perceive it, I think that there was uh, pretty much, you know, a concerted effort to do this. Now, oddly enough, you know, a lot of the things I've been saying is to be found, you know, like a line here, a line there, in such papers as the New York Times. Uh, Business Week, for instance, estimated some figures that were pretty close to mine when they did an article on junk. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has done this kind of thing. The Christian Science Monitor. I mean, if you start reading back and you start, like, looking at... For instance, I mean, one of the things I do is when I begin to discover something like that fact I mentioned of 83% of junk uh, coming from Indochina, then I begin to look at all the other political things that are happening around that area and start to ask myself certain questions. How are these things involved? How are they related? You know, And uh, it becomes kind of fascinating because obviously, as I said, it's not the whole answer, but it's a part of the answer. That's a fantastic amount of money to deal with. You know, The other thing is <clears throat> what uh, some of the other issues I raise is what happens with all that money. Money by itself doesn't bring in more money. Money has got to be made legitimate, it has to be invested, uh, and I think that that's part of what the mafia certainly seems to imply that it's doing, getting into legitimate business. Where does that money come from? It comes from a variety of sources, not the least of which certainly is, is heroin. So. On one hand, you said that people can function on heroin and drugs, and on the other hand, you said it's cooling dissent. Now, why, uh, particularly in terms of new left people, do they find drugs more romantic uh, than revolution? Well, I, I think <clears throat> what's happened with the new left is, um, that is, this past stage of it, that there were a lot of romantic trips involved. Um, an, incredible, uh, an incredible identification with uh, street people, with blacks, uh, without any kind of critical content involved. And um, what started to happen with a lot of these people is they started to follow certain patterns that they thought that were very cool, very hard, uh, like, like blacks were supposed to do. In other words, they had a, cardboard, a cardboard image of what blacks were about. Uh, a lot of their politics were geared uh, towards the most revolutionary, the most hip elements of, of the blacks, the Panthers, without any kinds of criticism taking place of what they were doing or what they were not doing. Um, well, if you start to emulate the folk mores and the folk customs, you know, you, you find yourself doing all kinds of things that are basically, in a sense, counter-revolutionary. Also, it, it screws up your politics enormously. I mean, if you are going to accept one or another particular uh, aspect of, uh, let's say, a, a, a grouping as the revolutionary vanguard, 
you're going to follow what their their politics pretty much down the line without any kind of critical evaluation. There were a lot of other things that that fed it, but this is the area. You know, since this is the area we're talking about, I mean, um, that that's what happened to people. Um, now I don't know. I, people are beginning, from what I can perceive, to come down off this trip and to to ask certain very hard questions and make some very hard statements about what they should be doing. I mean, uh, look, I think, for instance, the Cuban Revolution is great, but what does that tell us about our experience? What does that tell us about Americans? I think the, the Vietnamese are absolutely heroic, but what has that got to do with our experience? I mean, it's not that I say we should neglect them, but we have to look at the, you know, the, the revolutionary potential of all kinds of people. In other words, what I'm saying is revolution has got to talk American. You know? And if it doesn't talk American, nobody understands what it's about. It's very true that there are all kinds of international political ramifications to everything that affect our lives. But that still doesn't mean, you, you know, you've got millions of people who are discontented in this country, who are starting to move in some way, who really, literally never understood, I mean, it could have been Bulgarian to them, what, you know, what the new left was about. And I had a concrete example of this, you know, like some weatherman people came down to some of the meetings we were having, and they talked what they thought was street talk. It could have been Hegel. They didn't under the, the kids did not understand what they were talking about. You know, uh, they seemed to look alike. I mean, you know, they would wear you know like ragged dungarees, things like that. But the kids' rags were real. I mean, and the kids could spot that class difference, which would consist of maybe you know like even the way the hair was worn or that the sloppiness was fake or things like that. They really could perceive this with, with, with a kind of precision as if they were all running something like a, a social register. They knew the difference between these people and themselves. They really clearly knew it. Um, well, you know, the point about revolution is it's not romantic and romanticism kills you. And in a sense, I think it's killed, you know, like I, I've known, I've known, uh, very, you know, like very hard stone revolutionaries who read like religiously everything Lenin ever wrote and at the same time they were into sniffing cocaine. Uh, you know, like there was this whole mythology about, you know, like well we function better on speed. But you know, like, I mean a comparison between what various segments of the old left did in terms of production of even things like leaflets and what a lot of new revolutionaries did in producing stuff that had to be produced was, you know, there's no comparison. They couldn't do it. I mean, you know, like, they, they take mimeograph machines and foul them up, you know. Things wouldn't get done. I mean, people were, you know, partly stoned out of their heads. They thought they were doing things. I mean, in this whole business about, you know, like, drugs liberate you. I know enough acid freaks who are right-wing acid freaks on good acid, you know. I mean, uh, I mean, Allen Ginsberg distinguishes between mafia acid and good acid. But, I mean, I've known right-wing types who are on good acid, you know. I mean, they've got the hair, they've got the bells, uh, they smoke grass, they do all these things, and their political sensibilities haven't changed one iota. So drugs isn't what it does. It can function on heroin if your supply is assured. But what a lot of the kids started to do, for one thing, is that they got involved in the junkie life, that is, the stealing life, things like that, uh, the, whole, the whole scene. See, one of the things that's happened is that... Um, a, a big segment of the movement and youth in general have been turned into, in effect, small businessmen. You know, and like the, that's like really the basic mystique. Uh, there are drugs you can't function on. I mean, that you have the illusion that you can function on. Uh, people think they can function on speed. That's not true. People think they can function on cocaine. That's not true. I mean, they can for short periods of time, but you know, not sustained work. Uh, people can't function on acid. You know, really. And uh, depending on the amount of grass they've had, they can't function very well on that. Heroin they can function on. Methadone they can function on. If the supply is assured, that's the important thing. If you don't have to hustle for where it's, where it's going to come from, uh, then you're all right. I mean, you know, like recently uh, it's come out that, you know, there are big, there are big managerial types, executives who are, who are now on junk. They function very well. In fact, they function better than they used to when they were alcoholics, you know. Um, but again, they know where it's coming from. They're going to have it. They're going to have that steady supply without any difficulty whatsoever. See? Partly, I think, it's, it's hard to expect, on the one hand, that a, a group of people who have just been worked on just as much as somebody, you know, like, who is, like, forever wedded to the suburbs. I mean, also, they grew out of a kind of an isolated uh, elite experience, 
I mean, it's partly, you know, like arrogance went into that, and part of that they're beginning to admit, they're beginning to admit that kind of thing. Uh, they're also beginning to, you know, like, what they didn't realize, for instance, is that there would not have been such a thing as youth culture in this country without, you know, like, vast communications and media deciding to support that very notion, and they should have been suspicious of a youth culture that grows out of the media. I mean, after all, look, I mean, a lot of the forms that, let's say, the cultural forms that the, the movement took were around a long time before. The point is, they began to be pushed for a variety of reasons, that they were useful, I think, in suppressing consciousness. But, you know, the impression I get that, like, within the most radical elements of the movement, a lot of people, not the leadership, are beginning to ask a lot of questions about that. They're beginning to ask questions about their own history. They're beginning to, uh, and they're beginning to talk about, well, we've been inhuman to a lot of people. I mean, so, you know, that's, a, that's an incredibly hopeful sign. I think the leadership, as far as that's concerned, is shot, you know. And Like, in one, one of my more ironic moments, I've said that the... Um, the white revolutionary force, and to an extent, I meant the um, I meant the the hippie community too. Like I, I used to say that they were the cutting edge of the ruling class. Now, in a sense, what was happening, I think, is that there was like a huge cultural leveling that was that had been taking place, uh, because <clears throat> the point is that previous kinds of cultural social relations actually worked in a variety of ways against capitalism, and I think that part of it is, you know, like the interesting thing is you, you drive through like parts of Brooklyn near where I am, uh, you, you, you know, like there's an Italian community there, but the young are, uh, you know, like they now dress hippie style. And I think part of this is that, you know, again, the question always puzzled me, why was this particular culture pushed? Because people push things for reasons, you know, the, the hippie culture. And in, in effect, I'm beginning to wonder now that if, you know, like, Part of the way of breaking up all these communities was just this particular way. That in, in effect, that the, 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 the hippie kids, without realizing it in themselves, were generating a revolutionary change, but a revolution not from the left, but from the right. Again, this is not the same as the radicals who were like, in a sense, so, so super Leninist, so super Maoist, so super everything, that in effect what, what was happening was that they were really being counter-revolutionary because nobody could really understand what they were about, you know. You, you've pointed out some of the connections or some of the apparent connections between the, the government and junk. Um, and I was kind of wondering if you've, if you've got any information about the role of the uh, Federal Food and Drug Administration in this, in this whole picture and of, of academics uh, scientists and, and professors who, you know, take various sides in the question of the legalization of pot or the, or the, or the use of, uh, of methadone for treatment of heroin and things like this. I mean, you know, uh, does it come down to who's paying off who and that kind of thing? Have you been able to come up with anything like along, along those lines? Uh, no, it's, uh, that, that kind of stuff I think is, <clears throat> in, in, the sen in, in the conspiracy sense, that's hard to come by. I mean, um, what we've done is, I think, to rationalize our conspiracies. In other words, uh, you don't get paid off for doing a thing, you get a project, you get funded for a project. Interestingly enough, uh, I notice in today's times that um, they're now starting to push a chemical answer to the heroin problem. Uh, and, you know, it's what I say at the very end of the article, that, you know, like, the glorious future, or the control of people can lie in this kind of thing. Uh, and this means that Therapists may be out, <clears throat> but other kinds of people will be in, you know. Uh, I think that, that chemical control is much more efficient and much more cheaper, uh, much cheaper than, let's say, uh, and especially in a time of tight money, you know. Uh, it's much cheaper, for instance, than uh, psychiatric uh, therapeutic control, where <clears throat> you're always, in a sense, beginning to touch on dangerous grounds because you're talking about a person's motivations. Well, if you just lay drugs on them, chemicals of one sort or another to, to get him away from his tensions, you're not concerned with the motivations at all, you know. I mean, in a sense, you know, like some people have proposed the legalization of heroin, which it used to be legalized for a long time ago, as an answer. Well, you know, fine, if you want to cool the tensions, that's an answer. But on the other hand, what this does, I mean, what this creates is people who cannot function. Look, there's, there's another aspect that I didn't talk about, which...
nobody as far as I know and I, I mean again this may be written up and I just haven't seen it because a lot of the stuff becomes hard to find if you don't know where to look which is like the crucial thing the way this country was helped function by the use of liquor is absolutely fantastic I mean liquor is so crucial in the development of this country I mean when people were doing you know like we hailed them as great pioneers but after all they were doing incredibly inhuman jobs and like a lot of our great pioneers functioned drunk most of the time because they could not face the loneliness and the misery I mean, there are so many ram ramifications to the use of it I do point out for instance at one point in English history what they st what they did was they had a surplus of grain and they had like a fantastic urban population that had been pushed in from the uh, the engrossment uh, of, of uh, the enclosure of British lands and what they did was they converted most of that grain into liquor and they laid it on people they laid it on, on people living in the slums at an incredibly cheap price right the Hogarth thing gin lane well that that kind of thing has gone on in America time and time again and there's a there's, there are a couple of novels by uh, Truman Nelson about uh, uh, John Brown where you know like the use of liquor in voting in generating vo directed violence you know the interesting thing is, you know, there are all kinds of mystiques about mobs, the, que the whole question of spontaneous uprisings and very controlled uprisings. The point is that most, for instance, uh, parenthetically I should say that most vigilante actions have been organized always by the best elements in town, always. I mean, they've never, they've never sprung spontaneously. I think there may be something in it because from what, I can, from what I've seen so far, most radical revolutionary uh, protesting mobs have arisen, arisen spontaneously and most right-wing mobs have been organized and uh, you know that's another facet of American history we don't know about you know th there is so much a buried history in this country I mean and that people are starting to uncover and to reinterpret things that we just took for granted you know and you see the thing that you've got to struggle against is when you re you're reading this stuff as as a kid it becomes mythology for you and then you've got to struggle against it because you're really believing this emotionally because that's what you learn in your youngest phase you know and then you start to find out all this other stuff and I mean it really shatters your whole consciousness you know because I think absolutely history is absolutely crucial I mean how many people really have learned you know that uh, the Constitution is a carefully planned economic document that's worked out between two factions for a kinds of economic control and that what what one of the geniuses of American politics has been has been to disguise economic issues as political issues. And what I would see, like the new left, for instance, makes some like hyper excited statements about this being a fascist country. And the way I would formulate it would be: we have political democracy, but economic fascism, and that's what we've always had. I mean, and the the thing I want to add is: I mean, do I think that people like, let's say. Um, the Nixons or the uh, Mitchells or the, Ed, the J. Edgar Hoovers are sophisticated enough to understand this. No, I don't think they're sophisticated enough, but I mean, social scientists are for hire. Social scientists spend their lives watching people and figuring out what to do about them. I mean, and, uh, uh, you know, they, they do, they run things through computers, they do, they do systems analysis, but also they send out and they, they, they take samples of everything that's happening. I mean, the kinds of, the way that the movement and you know I mean both the political movement and let's say the uh, the hippie movement was watched and tabulated was fantastic and you can start to make projections about where people's heads are in mass and you can start to act about that I mean and ultimately I mean people have to realize that political scientists were not detached intellectuals because there's no such thing most intellectuals are for hire and they go to where the money is because there's a lot of money and a lot of prestige and a lot of prerogatives that go with running projects and things like that. So, uh, I mean, we, we, we you know, the, the academics, the, the kind of liberal academics have said that we have, you know, like a, an objective science. It's not an objective science. It's always been for hire. I mean, if you take a look at the kinds of projects that are funded by the Department of Defense, by the Institute for Defense Analysis, for groups like that, on analyzing things, stuff that's, that seems absolutely abstract, as, ab as abstract as Aristotelian, uh, Arabic Aristotelianism, I mean, they find a use for that. And so, you know, what happens is somebody develops a notion of how things would happen. I mean, he may not formulate it in the terms like, let's get junk, but other people can make that kind of connection, especially if they have an investment in the industry. Also, we've got to remember, I think that one of the most absolutely crucial factors in how this country has maintained itself
lies in its whole educational system. And by that, I don't only mean what happens in the schools and in the colleges, but what, ha what happens, you know, like in every aspect of life. I mean, to me, you know, a TV commercial is a political statement as well as a, a statement to sell. I mean, <clears throat> and the politics and the mythology that supports that is very carefully, you know, manipulated by people who are very cool about that. Uh, the other thing is that we have to remember that fantastic amounts of information have been withheld from students, even college students, graduate students, as to what their real history was. I mean, I, I just noticed, for instance, the other day that uh, some reprint house has just has just issued 43 volume set of mass violent history of mass violence in America. Now, when you say, is there is there that much that'll fill 43 volumes? I mean. I mean, I, I've been studying American history like for the past two years in conjunction with what I'm trying to write, and I mean, it is blowing my mind at the, the kinds of manipulation. Any time any kind of insurgent movement has come up, it has been co-opted, destroyed, uh, redirected, I mean, very, very consciously. I mean, <clears throat> when, when you, all you've got to do is ask yourself, why does a certain kind of, let's say, educational movement come to the fore? And why do people invest in it? Why do people get turned on to it? And who is behind it? You know, and then you start to see that, like a lot of theories that emerge, are after all really funded by the by the very people that presumably, in some way, it threatens. But it's also redirected. I mean, there has never been the absence of the American hand in the educational system. I mean, it's happened up and down. All all you've got to do is to like go through and question any history text that you've got about. Did, I mean, look, even the simplest thing. Uh, I recently read a dictionary of American history, and what I did was I looked in the the index. Now the index did not have the heading rebellion or revolution in it. You know, I mean, it had the Revolutionary War. All right. Now that's that's a political act. Just making up an index is a political act. Yet there were two or three rebellions that are mentioned in the 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 body of the text themselves. That nobody knows about the one thing called the Helderberg War, which took place in upstate New York, where peasants rose up. Uh, I mean, they weren't peasants, but they rose up against their Dutch landlords. Uh, the Door War, which took place in Rhode Island. I mean, there's so many things that have happened in this history that have absolutely been submerged. There are all kinds of analyses that people haven't even begun to make. I mean, the relationship of politics and sex and things like that. Uh, like, why were a lot of the communitarian sexual political movements like smashed in one way or another um, for instance why was it important when you ask yourself for why why would why do people get outraged by the Mormons I mean did they get outraged because of their sexual behavior or did they get outraged because they represented a different kind of economic threat much in the same way as the South represented a different kind of economics for the North I mean in that partly tied to what they were doing economically and their social mode of organization, including, you know, their sexual behavior, that represented a threat. And so the only thing that you could really, you know, like, you couldn't attack their economics because obviously they were building up uh, a very successful working enterprise, so you attacked their sex, you know. I mean, you know, you have instances of this again and again and again. I mean, to an extent, what happened, for instance, in the late 1800s uh, was when, when the muckrakers began to write, to an extent, I mean, the muckrakers were encouraged by the most advanced elements of the capitalist class. Encouraged because obviously there were inconsistencies in the way the whole system operated. There was cutthroat uh, competition. You had to rationalize the whole thing. So therefore, certain criticism should be mounted. But when things got sticky, or when they got their stuff together, I mean, that stuff was cut out for the most part. I mean, there are books around, like, I, I mean, you just read a book like Gustavus Meyer's uh, history of American for uh, Great American Fortunes, which doesn't present much of an analysis, but what you see again and again and again is the ability of rich men to buy Congresses wholesale. I mean, and that has not stopped to this day. I mean, <clears throat> the the kinds of manipulations have just grown more sophisticated. People don't bribe people on the surface; they bribe them other ways. Uh, the industries that that are regulated are regulated by people who have an interest in those industries. I mean, that kind of thing goes on. You can make a law, for instance, suppressing a kind of a drug, but that law is, in fact, geared to encourage certain kinds of, or may even act as a kind of a tariff, as I think Operation Intercept acted, in favor of heroin. But, I mean, like, look, we've just, we've just seen this thing take place where uh, it's been said that subsidies to farmers are going to be held down to $50,000 per farm. Now, of course, if you read the list of the amounts of subsidies given to 
farmers, you see, it's always big farmers who get it, and the rest of the small farmer never gets it. But what stops it? I mean, the loop, there's a loophole there. Nothing stops the farmer from dividing his big farm, his agribusiness thing, into a number of small farms, for each of which you'll get $50,000, you know. I mean, in other words, the kinds of sophisticated manipulation in, in this country is, I mean, that's what you have to know about, so that you can, like, pinpoint it and figure out what your political action is. I think people are getting wiser about that. I mean, you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, like, it's all bad, and they're not knowing why it's bad, but at least they're beginning to say that. And they never, and the kinds of people that, you know, it, it isn't the student movement. It's even middle-class people who perceive in a way that their children's lives are absolutely threatened by smog or, uh, n you know, by, by pollution or nuclear war, what have you. Uh, Working-class people are beginning to move, certainly not on the upper echelon, but they're not going to move. I mean, they're directly and intrinsically tied into this system, and they have been certainly since before Gompers, but Gompers was like the man who made that, that basic alliance, where they perceived that the... Um, the welfare of a small part of the uh, working class was directly tied in with imperialism. Yeah. What I would really like to ask you now is uh, what kind of things you think we can do to solve the problems of drugs, which is a symptom of the problems of society? <coughs> Well, uh, in my more bitter moments, I, I think uh, that, well, yeah, like every, every, every junkie, everybody who gets hooked on junk becomes like one more thing that brings down the society, and so that therefore we should really work for uh, more junkies, many more junkies, including from as many as possible from the middle classes and the ruling classes and what have you. Uh, that's when I'm feeling bitter about things. The other thing is, I, I mean, you know, like... In relation to that, the, the, the way trying to organize or deal with people who are you know, really stoned is like an incredibly difficult thing. But the point is, um, when people begin to see that everything about their consciousness has been manipulated, uh, possibly, I mean, possibly they start to move. Now, ultimately, that means some kind, you know, that means like some kinds of massive organization that, that even means like different kinds of therapy that operate in an entirely different way, uh, where what I'm talking about is, in a sense, political therapy. Uh, I mean, like, who defines, let's say, such a thing as an Oedipus complex, which, like, floats in a metaphysical vacuum, as against the fact that what you feel in terms of tension is something very, very real social, and that your fantasies have got, like, a, like a political and an economic content. Um, the point is, what you have to come up with, I think, ultimately is partly some kind of a language and partly some kinds of things that people have to do in terms of changing their lives. I mean, again, it, it all comes down to organization. It all comes down maybe, maybe ultimately to party. I don't know. I think it's too soon for that. But the thing is that people are beginning to see that, you know, there is that, that everything, everything that they have taken for, for granted is up for grabs. Now, you know, like a system doesn't only run on on, you know, like military organization and economic organization. It also runs in, you know, like a, on its cultural investment. And that cultural investment is always manipulated by a ruling class with the help of, you know, like uh, cultural manipulators, te technology technicians, what have you. Um, but when people are start to question that, the value, the, the credibility, the faith in all the other forms of operation, like, start to dissipate. And I think that's what we're having now. I mean, after all, like the fact that you're going to buy things, spend money, do things like that involves an act of faith. I mean, it's almost a religious thing. Money itself is, a, I mean, credit is almost, you know, like it relates to the word credo, an act of faith. And that's breaking down. And that means that, as crazy as it seems to sound, as culture breaks down, that money in the bank and that money to finance all kinds of repressive institutions becomes devalued. And that's partly what's happening. I mean, you know, there are other kinds of inflation, but besides straight monetary inflation. And I think that, that cultural manipulators, educators, who establishment educators realize that very, very clearly. Because what they're doing is they're trying to fight to preserve every single thing that has been challenged, like in the, from 1960 to 1970. They're fighting, like, bitterly to, to maintain it. But at this point, given the economic crunch, the more they fight, the less credibility things uh, there is. 
Now, you know, like I can't come up with any specific forms. I mean, I, I could draw an abstract model. What, what sense does that make? I mean, you know, like you draw this abstract model of how you do things and how you want, where you want people to go and the, do they come together. I think what's happening all over the country is pe are people, and again, I don't mean the hyper-revolutionaries, but people who have come to a revolutionary position, people you wouldn't expect, to are starting to like grope around and try and organize in all kinds of ways, and that takes all kinds of forms. I mean, in a, in a weird way, given the investment, such a thing like, let's say, gay liberation, and certainly, absolutely certainly, women's liberation becomes a challenge to the ongoing thing. Uh, I mean, I mean, the ramifications of women's liberation, just on an economic level, are absolutely fantastic. When a woman defines herself as both a machine that produces children to service the state, aside from the inhumanity of her labor, you know, and starts to demand that you get paid for this, this demand, this, this has to call up a response. Part of that response has been to try and, uh, you know, buy the whole thing off by giving the vote, but that's not going to be enough. I mean, you give somebody the vote, that still doesn't take care of the kinds of oppression that you're suffering in an institutional way at home. Um, so, you know, like there's that, that whole factor, that's fantastic. I mean, people are ready to believe nothing, but, you know, again, like the interesting thing is, uh, like I said the time, in the beginning of the talk, I said the Times rejected that article. Now, a number of people that I would only call Times readers saw the article on stands and things and started to buy it. And what they would have called about two, three years ago, like a paranoid fantasy, now they, they read it and they say, yeah, that's right. That's really the way it is, you know. And, uh, I mean, I've, I've had the case, again, of middle-class people, <coughs> never, never mind the radicals, going out and buying a number of copies of this thing and passing them out to friends, you know. Uh, that means that people have moved a long way. I mean, like, what specifically developments, develops is hard to, you know, talk about. I mean, I think the crucial thing, the absolutely crucial thing is education. Like, I was on a, a radio broadcast recently, and this woman called me up. Uh, it was one of those, you know, phone-in shows. And she said, um, you know, she talked about, she'd read about Senator Gruning accusing the CIA and the uh, key of uh, uh, being involved in opium. And she said, why don't they pick up on this? And I said, well, you know, this is the United States. I mean, we don't lay our, our uh, censorship out on the surface. I mean, we're very subtle about that. I said, but why don't you take that article and just mimeograph it and pass it out to people? That's a form of political organization. People got to start doing that around the country. I mean, it may, you know, people have been taught that there are certain kinds of actions that look um, unre unrespectable. They look a little crazy, you know. But, I mean, you know, like, even the value of just, like, taking, there's a photograph I saw of bread lines in the 30s, just taking, a, 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 like, a, a picture of that and writing on one hand, like, Hoover, Nixon, you know, on that, and just passing it out at any employment agency, and especially a professional one. I mean, what does that do? People are ready to accept that kind of thing. They see that. I mean, people are beginning now, now the kinds of things even that someone like Nader is doing, that like all kinds of people are doing, like questioning everything, going into everything. People don't realize, but they're beginning to realize that they can research everything and find out the way it really functions. And as they do begin to do that, like, you know, like it begins to blow your mind. The system cannot, un cannot withstand that assault on the basic credibility, you know. And, I mean, partly everything that helps every single minute of the time is this, this basic involvement in Vietnam. I mean, because that it blows day by day the credibility and reveals step by step. I mean, you know, look, revolutions, I think, are at first initiated by the ruling class out of their stupidity and blindness, you know. So.